Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the second of the Business Gateway Back to Business webinars. Today, we are tackling the issue of restarting the tourism sector. Um, say thanks for joining us. We're going to give folk a few moments to join because we have a maximum crowd of 500 people who signed up for the webinar. And as you'll have found, it just takes a few moments to get through the registration process. So I'm watching the numbers steadily climbing, um, currently past 240. So we'll give folks a few moments just to, to get themselves in. In the meantime, um, what I'd like to do is, is get the panel that's with me this afternoon to introduce themselves, uh, just say a wee bit about themselves and their organisation. Anna, can I start with yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Hugh. So my name is Anna Miller. Um, hello, everybody. I am the Head of Tourism at Highlands Islands Enterprise and HIE is one of three enterprise agencies in Scotland. So in addition to ourselves, there's Scottish Enterprise and the newly formed South of Scotland Enterprise Agency. So we cover a broad area of Scotland, in fact, over half of the landmass of Scotland, but we only have about 9% of the population. So understandably, our area has um, a number of, of remote and rural communities and actually a fifth of our population live on islands. So we, we face some distinct circumstances in our region for our businesses and communities to operate. And as an enterprise agency, we're really committed to working with not just businesses, but our communities and our social enterprises to really take forward opportunities um, to, to help the, grow, the region grow and to prosper. So tourism right. is really important. So it's, it's understandably critical to our region and it, it plays a huge role in creating employment and sustaining our populations and providing opportunities for our young people. So delighted to be here today to see what we can Good. do to help. Thanks, Anna, and delighted to have you here. Gemma, can I ask yourself to introduce you? Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's Gemma Reid here from MBTAG. Um, well, one with many hats, I suppose. It's Gem Gemma Reid, MBTAG Project Manager. Um, also, Project Manager Scotland Starts Here, which is the marketing campaign. I've got my own events and sales business specialising in food, drink um, and tourism. And also a board member for the Developing Young Workforce representing Tourism for the Borders. It's great to be here today and hopefully we can be here to help. Good. And thanks for joining us, Gemma. Riddle. Yeah, hi, uh, Riddle Graham, Director of Industry and Destination Development with Visit Scotland. Uh, my team are the outfacing part of the organisation dealing with individual businesses, destination organisations, local authorities and all our key stakeholders, um, Business Gateway and COSLA being uh, a key stakeholder for us. Um, and that's my day job, but um, in, at this time, um, every Thursday, I also chair the Scottish Tourism Emergency Response Group, which is basically the three enterprise agencies that Anna's referred to, um, Skills Development Scotland um, and um, Scottish Government and the Scottish Tourism Alliance, um, all part of that, that, that wider um, important grouping. And Hugh, you're a key member of that. Keep us, keep us uh, in line and uh, uh, entertain us with your, uh, your quips. So I'm uh, looking forward to trying to help as many uh, inquiries today. Good. Oh, that's grand. And uh, myself, I'm Hugh Lightbody. I'm the Chief Officer for the Business Gateway National Unit in COSLA. So again, welcome everyone to this afternoon's webinar. We are just over the 300 mark now. We've just been doing a wee bit of introduction of the panel as we, we let people uh, join the call. Um, just a wee bit of the housekeeping. Just to let everyone know, we will be recording the session as we did the first one, and we'll be making it available afterwards to share with other business owners. Uh, everyone's been placed on mute to avoid any background noise. Uh, we asked people, businesses, to submit questions in advance, so we've got quite a few. Thank you very much for that. We will try and get through as many of them as we possibly can in the time available. But what we will do is make sure that whatever you have asked we will get answers uh, attached to the presentation, which will be circulated later. You do have the opportunity to ask questions in the question bit on, on the, uh, the webinar. And if we can, we will get to those and we will try and answer them. But as I say, if not, we will provide answers afterwards. So we'll make sure that we get that back to you. And we will be sharing those with, for example, Scottish Government to make sure that are alerted to any particular issues that are coming out. Um, so our panel of, of speakers, as, as they've introduced themselves, 
Uh, we're here to discuss what we know so far about how businesses operating in the tourism industry can prepare and plan for getting back to business safely post-COVID-19. Um, as I say, we're now up at 328, so we'll kind of get going. And the first and most important point to note is that Riddle and I have avoided a fashion disaster. We're not wearing the same shirt, so this is a, <laughs> this is a good start to the afternoon. So, COVID-19, considerations for getting back to business, making your business COVID secure. What advice can we offer people? And, and I suppose... The first kind of bit around that is people are going to be looking for practical guidance and, and practical information. Now, Gemma, I know you've done with some colleagues a power of work in producing a toolkit, which has just been launched yesterday on visitscotland.org. It's aimed at visitor attractions and experiences, but probably has a wider application. Can you tell us a wee bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so I'm, we at um, three of us attend the DLP calls, assemble calls on a Tuesday, and um, it came about um, as a furlough project originally. Um, and even though I'm not furloughed, um, thankfully at this time, and been very busy and active within tourism in the borders of Midlothian, but wanted to put my skills and expertise um, to try and help create tools for the business for the in, for the industry in general to. Um, see how they could come out of COVID. Um, so Karen from uh, Rabies, who's been furloughed, and Tian, who is um, also off at the moment, and I came together to create a toolkit. Um, and the toolkit is basically an interactive toolkit that has uh, what the key challenges are that we're all facing at this time. We then go into some really nice case studies of um, tourism businesses across the world that have um, come up with technological solutions um, in the past and at present, and then we come up with um, over 100 different technological solutions within the actual toolkit on how you might be able to take things forward. So it covers things from QR codes to online ticketing to um, hand sanitizers, you name it, um, apps, websites, social media, etc. And then we've got an additional section at the bottom where it goes into where you might get funding or where you might be able to get resource and help to create those um, new technologies for your business or your destination. Um, there's a glossary in there for people that don't know uh, what some of the words mean. Um, and we launched it yesterday on the DLP call. Um, and the great thing about it is that we've got it um, based on the visitscotland.org website. Um, and it's called Technology Solutions for Visitor Attractions and Experiences Yes, it's a mouthful, kind of says what it is on the tin, but um, I, I really do believe there's a lot of um, things within that toolkit that will benefit the whole tourism sector. Um, in addition to where it's placed on the actual website, we do have a video tutorial, how to use it and maximise it. It's 164 pages long. You do not need to read every page. There's lots of interactive links to it, so you can jump about depending on what's of interest to you. Um, and we, in terms of the future of it, this is very much version one. So what we've done is try to work with um, some really good case studies. We've then worked with their solution providers and so on. It's kind of gone around like that. But we want to make it a one-stop shop. Um, and we want to see that grow with a lot more Scottish case studies, a lot of more um, tech, techie companies in there that are based in Scotland as well. And we're looking to work with tech tourism cluster that have been set up to integrate it into an um, online directory on a, on a website. And then the next stage after that would be to also look at other tourism sectors such as events and accommodation. Um, it has gone viral last night, so please uh, do use it and um, maximise the opportunity to try and come out of this COVID crisis um, with new solutions. Uh, we'll share it again after after today's presentation as well. No, that's great. Thanks for that, Gemma. It is an incredibly comprehensive resource and you know recommend anyone to, to have a look at that um housed on visitscotland.org riddle i mean that that's the the you know the platform that's aimed at the kind of corporate market what other kind of resources do you have on there that would be valuable for people yeah i, I would strongly recommend uh, people looking at visitscotland.org and the COVID 19 section there because there is as you say there's a whole range of, of information i think that really important one um, is the the guidance to, to businesses. So what we've tried to do is look at the Scottish Government guidance, which is on there, uh, but then identify the important subsectors uh, beneath that generic piece. Um, so uh, UK Hospitality have got some great information for the 
service the accommodation sector um, and a whole range of um, other parts of that. Self caterers, um, Wild Scotland with the outdoor activity side, Sales Scotland, and then ASVA and the SSC. So um, what we've tried to do is identify those sectors where there is guidance already in place. And I notice a number of the questions relate to things like cleaning your self-catering property. What do I do if I get someone that gets ill in my property? All these uh, questions are covered in that particular sector guidance. So I notice quite a few of them are, are self-catering. So I would suggest anyone looking to get the answers there, ping onto visitscotland.org look at the ASSC, the Association of self Caterers in Scotland, and you'll get all the information you need and advice and support. But please, um, if there are questions that are not being answered, if people say, well, my sector's not covered there, then let me know um, through the, the, the chat line on this, um, and we'll uh, try and cover off any questions we've got. Okay, thanks for that, Rodon. You, you touched there. I mean, that is going to be an incredibly important part for it. And as you've said, some of these questions we've received touch on this health and safety being a key, not just for visitors, but also for, for the folks who run these businesses and for their employees. So Victoria in, in Fort William and Eleanor from Westrip Farm, both kind of similarly talking about the same kind of things. And it's about this issue you, you touched on of cleaning. Um, Victoria saying normally uh, clients will depart by 10 o'clock, she goes in, she cleans, and then the new clients arrive from 3 p.m. But Eleanor touching on that uh, new cleaning guidance, including reorganising guest bookings to allow a 48-hour gap between them to give time, fully air, clean, sand, all these kind of things. So is there specific guidance on that? Because that, that's there's quite a difference there between those those two examples of almost normal operation of allowing 10 to three o'clock and 48 hours. That's quite a difference. So so what kind of advice can we give in there? Anna, can I maybe jump to you on that one? Yeah, sure, no problem. So the, the guidance that's been produced by the Association of Scotland Self Caterers provides lots and lots of detail, right down to the, the nitty gritty of what uh, cleaning products use on particular surfaces, be that fabric surfaces, mahogany, um, you name it. So there's a, a huge range of information in there. Now, I had a look at that earlier and I didn't see any stipulation around time spans between um, somebody leaving a premises and the next people coming in. I think um, my interpretation of the guidance that I see is that um, really if you can deliver the, the requirements that are, are set down in terms of cleaning um, within whatever time scale it's going to take to do that in a safe and responsible way, then that's sufficient. Um, but I would encourage you to really get into that that guidelines and, and you know have a good read of them. Don't be put off by the fact that some of these guidelines are a little bit long. Um, they might be a little bit um, daunting at first when you pick them up but actually they've been written by the industry for the industry so these guidelines have been written by people who understand your circumstances which are kind of unique to your particular subsector so they're written in quite a straightforward practical way um, and I know that uh, Fiona at the Association of Self Caterers they've been in addition to the guidelines they are developing FAQs so if you've got a question after having read it for the first time jump onto the FAQs have a look and chances are somebody's asked a question that might be in your mind so lots and lots of guidance um, how to video Videos. Um, there's also training available. Um, so if you're a member of the ASSC, then there's training available around exactly what that means for your property in terms of cleaning. So lots of stuff there. So I think just you know get under the skin of the guidelines and and think about what that might mean for your particular circumstances in your business. Okay, thanks for that, Anna. Riddle, just as well on that, and again part of that question was was this issue, and again I think you touched on it. So what happens if a, a guest gets ill while they are in your self-catering or bed and breakfast establishment? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. It has been asked uh, of us in, uh, in, the, in the past, in the past two or three weeks already. And the guidance, um, I suppose, relates to the individual circumstance. Um, where has the person come from? How have they got to the, the premises? How ill are they? Um, the initial advice is um, if they are able to uh, go back to where they live, uh, to their home, then they should be actively encouraged if they're not too ill to go back there and not to encourage them to stay in the accommodation with all the inherent risks and the uh, added complexity there. So it very much depends on the individual circumstance. Um, and um, I think the guidance allows that flexibility. And you know, to follow up Anna's point, um, 
the guidance is exactly that it's guidance and i think you need to apply it sensibly to your individual circumstance because uh, one self-catering property uh, will be very different to another um but yeah it's it, it's a really good point and again it it, re it relies very much on on the individual there if someone is really quite ill then the advice is very clear that you need to get uh, nhs involved in that and get them to to deal with it but if it's just an initial um you know I'm, I'm not feeling too well then the advice is very clearly to encourage them to return to their home okay you, you mentioned there riddle the 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 risk word and, and one of the things we've added is as one of the handouts on the side the initial handouts is a risk assessment from the, the self-catering guy so incredibly useful Gemma, you you run obviously your own business so so you're a business person you will be i imagine uh, that will be part of and parcel of what you do uh, in terms of running your business, that risk assessment. Have you got any particular advice in relation to 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 risk uh, for businesses? I think I think the main thing is um, every business is completely different, and um, I deal with a multitude of different businesses um, down the borders with Lothian, from restaurants, bars to events to hotels. So everybody kind of really needs to assess what it was and probably put themselves in that position if they were going to a hotel, what they would do. I think that's always quite a good way to do it. Think, well, how comfortable would I feel about this or that, depending on what the setting is. Um, that's how I always feel that risk assessments are quite good to put yourself in that situation first, and also taking the guidance that's available from government and other partners such as the ASSC and other ones that are out there as well. Yeah, you just on okay. that point, um, I've, I've heard that the, actually the risk assessment templates are, are really useful actually as a business tool as well because it allows you to really look at some of the, your processes in, in, in detail and take a sort of step by step approach through that. So um, in addition to the, the function that they have clearly around the adoption of the guidelines, I think possibly actually even as a business tool as well, it allows you to just take a step back and look at your processes and how you do things within your yeah. own business that, that might actually give you little insights that you, you hadn't picked up before around maybe efficiencies, things that you could do differently, steps that could be perhaps cut out. So um, I think as a tool, it's quite a good business tool as well. And my understanding is that there's, in addition to the health and safety executive risk assessment, which is within the Scottish government guidelines, if you drop down then into the subsector trade body guidelines, which have been developed, there's there's quite often a, a secondary risk assessment there. So, you know, between the two, there's templates there for businesses to use. That's really and good. I think, Thanks I think, I think as well, Visitors will want to know that you've, you know, you've conducted those risk assessments for reassurance, um, and I know that there's reassurance schemes and things coming out too. So, um, it's, it's good practice to complete those. Uh, just on that, in terms, I mean, earlier on a previous one, we talked a previous webinar, we talked about this, this need for essentially a, a kind of operating plan that gave your employees and your customers the assurance or the reassurance that you were safe you were mm -hmm. safe as a business um and we've, we've just kind of touched on that there and, and certification i think was mentioned riddle any examples of of that coming forward yeah i mean two things that, that if you look at the scottish government guidance note there's a very strong element in the front end of that about engaging with um your employees if you have them and of course a lot of businesses in Scotland are one-man bands or a couple running a small business, so it's not appropriate. But in a lot of other cases, if you've got employees, any kind of employees, then they need to be engaged in that process. Um, I'm hoping that today, um, on the certification side, um, that we'll be able to announce the Good to Go scheme, um, right. which basically is a an online tool. It's self-certification. It takes businesses through a series of steps the first one being what country are you in because it's a UK wide initiative and there's a Scottish section in that that takes you to the guidance and to re-emphasize Anna and Gemma's points um, risk assessment is the second question being asked have you completed a risk assessment um, and then all the necessary things there it takes you through the process and then if you're uh, ticking all the, the correct boxes then you get the ability to use uh, a good to go mark uh, and also a certificate so there's a reassurance there to the customer uh, that you can put that on your website um, we're keen to highlight that on our main website visitscotland.com um, but it's also a reassurance to communities because i'm very conscious that a number of communities are slightly concerned about an influx of visitors and we're working very hard 
with all our partners on Stair to try and ensure that the two work together hand in hand in hand. But look out for good to go. Um, should again be on our website later today on the assumption it's been launched down south first, okay? No, that's great. Thanks for that, Riddle. Uh, and you, you touched there about the local communities, and I'm, I'm aware from from social media and I'm aware from various meetings that, that you and I have been involved in, uh, and in fact Anna and I have been involved in. That there are there are differing views around the country and from different uh, communities about the, the the opportunity and the risk associated with this. So it's it's important, as you say, to, to work with those local communities on all of this. Businesses have been responding to this in different ways. Some businesses have diversified. So we've seen restaurants who have started takeaway operations uh, very successfully, which is great, and, and that's been been working. Um, Gemma, just again from the from the business point of view, any kind of thoughts or advice you, you would have for a business that was thinking about the 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 diversification opportunity or adapting their business to return to trading. Um, maybe they've done something to to diversify, as I say, a restaurant uh, to to um, take away. Any advice for them going forward? Yeah, I mean, I th on a couple of things on that. I think that um, ones that have taken that leap um, to in order to survive during this time, and uh, there's been a number of them down here that have done it really, really well. But yes, to survive. I think my message to them would be you need to keep that up as part of your business plan going forward because there will still be people that do not want to come out and sit in a restaurant or sit in a bar. They will still want to have something nice to eat, so deliveries um, um, and takeaways are, should be an, um, an optimum within most plans going forward for restaurants and bars, um, in my opinion. Um, I think in terms of diversification, I think being online is obviously an absolute priority. Now more than ever, we've kind of excelled gone accelerated away from where we were a few months ago into a complete digital landscape. So again, making sure that they're online, making sure that they've got e-commerce. If it's a shop, um, I've seen a number of businesses down here starting to sell things online, um, starting to sell tickets or selling vouchers for things while, they, well, while they're not able to open, um, but also looking at how things can be done differently because it will be a new normal and it will be a new normal going forward, not just now. So um, I think there is huge opportunities and that's one of the big things that we're focusing on down in the borders and we're building hand-holding businesses to try and make these small changes to fit with the new normal landscape. Okay, great. No, that's really useful. Thanks for that. Um, there are obviously, as we had, as I said earlier, a number of questions coming in for us, and, and one of them, quite specific concern from from uh, James Wallace of Scott US Tours, who, who runs a small tour business, um, particularly for visitors from the United States. Coach tours, very hard mm -hmm. thing to restart with social distancing measures in place, says, says James. Any resources or advice available to help businesses with that transition? Riddle, can I come to you on that one? Yeah, I, I think that's a is a really tricky one. We we got a heads up on this about a week, ten days ago, um, from some of the smaller uh, guide operated, you know, like so Rabies and Haggis, how they're going to uh, work their business. Interestingly, the, the Transport Scotland Transport Guidelines um, are a bit silent on this, um, uh, and we're very aware that it is an issue. Um, so I, I don't have an answer right now, but what I can say is that. My team is working on it, um, and we'll get we'll get an answer here. Um, a lot of it depends on the two meter to one meter situation, because that makes a massive difference to a whole range of businesses. Right now, the two meter is very much in play uh, in Scotland, um, and it, who knows it might it might be relaxed in, in due course. But that makes a big difference to the ability of a lot of businesses to be able to open. But in this particular case, a massive difference to being able to operate. Uh, groups. Um, and so I'm, I'm sorry I don't have an answer, but my team is working on it. And as soon as we've got clarity, um, I'll make sure it's fed back to the particular person that asked the question. Yeah, no, not a problem. I, I was aware that, that you were already alert to, to that issue and you were working on it. So I thought it was important to, to make sure that message got across. We've talked in terms of, of some of those questions uh, very much about the kind of self-catering. We, we've kind of touched on B&Bs, so that's where the accommodation is here. Um, I suppose one of the questions we've got, though, is what if you're bringing the accommodation with you? 
and that might be a caravan or it might be a tent. So, so we have a, a, a query here, which is has come in from uh, Mark Hibbert, who's running a campsite and a camper van hire business. So vital that the campsites will be able to open this summer. Uh, but the, Mark feels there's a bit of confusion about other sites with shared services, for example, toilets or showers will be able to open. That guidance you talked about, Riddle, is that cover this particular aspect? Yeah, it does. And I, I, I hope that um, it isn't unclear because the camp, we've been dealing with a campaign caravanning um, organisations, uh, NCC, um, Campaign Caravan Club, a lot of them, uh, and there is clear guidance there. Um, there is absolutely no reason why uh, a campsite or a caravan site that's licensed um, should not be able to open if they follow the, the cleaning protocols that are laid down and are, are in the guidelines. So again, check on visitscotland.org for that particular section. And if there are any concerns about that, then you know let me know because um, we'll happily uh, point in the right direction. But you know when I read that, I I, I, I was concerned that um, there should be no confusion there. As soon as the green light is given to the opening, that it should be uh, possible for that to happen. Okay, no, that's, that's useful. I mean, Anna, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, actually. Um, so I think information is key in this point. So um, a number of, of potential visitors to, to camping and caravan sites may make a wrong assumption that some of these caravan and camping sites might be open when in actual fact the, the operator may have chosen actually for various reasons that they are absolutely entitled to, to make themselves that they, they don't want to open. So I think um, there's a real need for, for excellent communication and information provision around what's available what's open, what's not, and that extends beyond um, camping and caravan sites to uh, local facilities, so be that public toilets or be that um, car parks, um, litter emptying and things like that. I think there's just a real need to make sure that our, our businesses are doing whatever they can to make that information available through be it their own social media or on their own websites. So just set out quite clearly so that your customers know what to expect. Um, and they can use that information ahead of, of planning a trip. So they really need to, visitors need to make sure that they're planning ahead, thinking ahead and being informed. And I know that a number of the local authorities are already making that information available. So they're already setting out quite clearly on their websites what public toilets are available and um, already open and which will be closed. And some of our partners, so Historic Environment Scotland and others, they're already setting out what uh, attractions are going to be open and, and not. So I think there's a role for all of us actually in that, not just an obligation for businesses, but I think as visitors um, and as people moving into different areas, we all need to be making the efforts to make sure that we've made ourselves fully informed and draw down as much as we can on that. So I would really encourage businesses to to either go through their destination organization who I know are collating a lot of this information if you don't have a destination organization you know speak to your speak to your neighboring businesses find out who's opening up locally find out how you can work together and um, how you can make that information as available as possible for your potential visitors okay you, can I just add to that and I think Anna's made an absolutely brilliant point there what we're trying to do is coordinate that on a Scotland-wide basis so we've got 15,000 uh, entries on visitscotland.com and we're going out this week to all of them to say, um, are, you are you planning to open come the 15th of July? Uh, and if so, um, can you please update your entry on visitscotland.com? So we'll have, uh, the message at the moment is, just as Anna said, please check before you go. But what we would like to do is be even more helpful and say, by the way, we know that the following properties are going to be open. Um, they might have changed opening hours or there might be restricted access or whatever, but we rely very heavily on those businesses to do that job for us because we, we don't know. So we'll be going out with a big mail shot. We'll be going through our regional teams, through the destination organisations. But anyone on this call that's got an entry on visitscotland.com, can I please ask them to just check the entry uh, and give us a clear indication of whether or not they're going to be open. If they've not got an entry in .com, I would of course say, well, you should have, um, because it's free of charge. Um, so it's crazy and uh, not not to be on .com, and we will happily uh, get you all lined up in terms of the the details on that. But um, Anna's point is absolutely spot on. The more we can share that information, so we'll do it on a Scotland wide basis, uh, working with everybody on the call and with those groups. No, that's, that's excellent. So so there was Riddle's sales pitch, folks, for for those of you on the call who are not. <laughs> currently uh, with Visit Scotland, it's free 
and there are huge uh, benefits involved in, in doing that. So I encourage you to, 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 to do that. Um, just while you're talking about that riddle, I, and every day they say is a school day, uh, obviously, I discovered earlier that there is both VisitScotland.com and VisitScotland.org, and they are for two different things. What ones, you know, the, the kind of the visitor one, the commercial one, and and ones the, uh, the the corporate one, as we were saying earlier. So, so you're talking there about collating that information, and I happened to catch sight, which must have been on the VisitScotland.com one, of you know what's open, what's happening, what's going on. A really good guide for people coming on what's going on. Yeah, um, and you're right, uh, and it is a wee bit confusing, but um, most most folk, um, most businesses would not necessarily look at visitscotland.com in the first instance, because that's the, the consumer facing site. And we've been putting out messages of reassurance. Um, and, you know, our, our early um, um, don't forget us campaigns, you know, um, we're still here and once we're able to open, we hope that you'll return uh, will be replaced in due course by proper marketing campaigns that will encourage day visits in the first instance. Uh, we'll be focused very much on the Scottish market initially uh, and the domestic England market as well. We're not envisaging a significant return to international visitation until uh, into next year. Yeah, so yeah, that's .com. .org is very much the business uh, part of it. So anyone looking for the advice that we talked about earlier on would go there. Okay. No, that's really useful. Gemma, you were touching earlier on all the various different things that you're involved in. From a, a point of view of the destination management organisations, what's your experience on, on those? What's my experience with the destination management organisation? Yeah. I suppose MBTAG kind of is one, um, and we're in the process of setting up another one for the South of Scotland called the Sco uh, South of Scotland Destination Alliance, so um, which will become a destination, a proper DMMO, which is a destination management marketing organisation. <laughs> um, after all the work that's been built up from MBTAG to really drive that for Borders and Dumfries and Galloway, so. I feel that they have, they will have a bigger role to play now more than ever. Um, they work very much in conjunction with Visit Scotland, the Tourism Alliance, all the key associations like your ASFA, your ALVA, your um, ASSC. So I think that um, make sure that wherever you are in Scotland that you are linked in with your DMO um, or DMMO to make sure that you're maximising opportunities in terms of events, business engagement, collaboration, innovation. Um, I think we're all going to have to really come together now more than ever, and to have that um, key organisation that you can that you can go to for support um, and guidance and um, creation of new things um, is is going to be imperative to come out of this crisis. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if there was any letters of the alphabet we missed there with all those acronyms <laughs> you're, you're throwing about. There might have been one or two. Acronyms uh -huh. and two, isn't there? Can you just on that point, if I can just yeah. jump in as well. I'm I'm aware that there's. Some really nice examples of, of where DMOs at local level are, are doing almost what we're doing today in terms of um, helping businesses at a local level to understand and interpret the guidance. And sometimes that's just actually about facilitating a conversation across their members. So there's some really nice examples, um, Sky Connect and, and Karen Gorham and, and others across the whole of the country that are already doing this. So if you're not engaged in those conversations, just on the back of what Gemma is saying, you know, you know, get in touch, um, look at their website, see what they're doing. There's lots of conversations going on. So um, chances are that some of the businesses in your area are, are facing the same things as you. So I would really encourage that, that businesses do get engaged in contact. And they're they're having a really important role at the moment in terms of what Riddle was describing earlier on around community engagement. So a number of our destinations engage with um, with local councillors, with community trusts and community organisations and, and really bring them into the conversation around what tourism mean for that destination. Because as we all know, it impacts on on not just our visitors and our businesses, but on the people that live in, and work in these environments and these destinations as well. So that sort of bigger inclusive um, opportunity and I think the DMOs have a real important role to play in all of that. No, that, that makes good sense. I mean just touching on that then a wee bit further, Gemma you made the point that we, we have to come together better to, to kind of respond to this and come out the far side hopefully stronger um, and I imagine wiser. Um, is there therefore a, a role for, for DMOs or, or DMMOs and the various other things that you're saying there, in terms of that kind of that self-support opportunity, that 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 ability for them, members of those organisations to support each other, does does that happen already? Do you think there'll be more of that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we've all got stuff that we could be learning off each other, um, you know, whether it's down to the community side of things, whether it's skills development, whether it's um, engagement and collaborations, depending on commonalities of product. It, I mean, it could be any number of things. And um, one of the things I said to someone last week is that we've got to stop doing itineraries that are within our own tiny region or our region. We need to start thinking about where is that visitor coming from? Is it from Newcastle? Is it from Glasgow? And how do we get them to come in there? But then think about what their journey after that might be. It's about so it's about creating that and creating products that we should all be working together on to make that visit to Scotland um, the best experience possible. Oh, that's great. Yeah, on that, I mean, Anna mentioned a, a few examples. There's a really good example just came to me about a month ago. Um, the three, I think it's the Three Glens Business Reopening Group, and it's at the bottom of. Uh, Loch Ness, Anna, you're probably aware of it. And it was a hotelier who got together with about 20 or 30 other businesses in the area to share the common issues and problems. Um, and then they did a really good thing. They To reassure the local community, they got the local community involved in the discussion. And now I get copied in in their, the minutes of their meeting and they're talking about how do we get hand san sanitizers? Where are we going to put information? The real practical things that need to happen at a local level at an appropriate level for the businesses in that area and i've been really encouraged by we started off with two or three examples and now we've got well over a dozen of things that are happening and i'm a great believer and i have been all my life of stealing other folks good ideas and there's some really good ideas flying around there so if someone's developed a wee uh, welcome charter and kieran gorms is a good example of that then mm -hmm. steal that um, and make it work for your area, and I, you know, I think that's that that innovation part is that helping each other is is very much uh, a strong part of the the destination approach. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, I, I suppose in a kind of similar way around that, I, I read the other day um, some Glasgow businesses, experienced Glasgow, have come up with a hospitality action plan to mm -hmm. to safeguard jobs and businesses, and and they've they've kind of shared that with Glasgow City Council. They're looking to to look at um, how together they can actually work and and create an opportunity to to get open again. So I think that's quite important to to do that kind of sharing and joining up. And I'm aware that there was an announcement um, at half twelve there from the first minister. You you talked earlier there, Riddle, about you've gone out to the to the your fifteen thousand members. You're asking them about a, you know where are you and getting ready because we're we're talking about the fifteenth of July and, and getting going. But the world is moving round about us, even as we have been kind of uh, speaking and preparing for this webinar, because we've now heard that self-contained holiday units with no shared facilities can open from the 3rd of July and outdoor beer gardens from the 6th of July. So does that have any implications for people or do you, do you think that folk will already be well advanced in their plans on the basis that the 15th of July was trailed a wee while ago, so folk will be ready to go, or, or you know, what's your thinking on that? Well, I I think it's fantastic news for a start, um, and I think from what I could make out, I haven't seen the actual announcement. There is also to be a relaxation in terms of the five mile travel because I was laughing earlier on. That meant I would be able to travel four miles up the road to Kelso for self catering, but if that's been relaxed, then I can go anywhere in Scotland if that's the case. Um, I think some businesses will be ahead of the game and will be ready and prepared. I think quite a few businesses will, will have been taken by surprise, to be honest. Um, but that doesn't mean to say, I mean, I certainly speaking to Fiona Campbell in the Association of Self-Caterers, she was saying um, three, four weeks ago that self-catering was ready to go. Um, and now that we've got the protocols and the guidance in place, there's no reason why that can't be. So I think that will be hugely encouraging for a very important sector of our industry. I think she'd also. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think I think it does highlight the point, and we all know this that things change so rapidly at the moment, um, you know, on, a, on a, almost a daily basis. And I think the guidelines that have been produced, um, I think it's just that with that caveat that as things move and change, these guidelines will need to 
potentially evolve and move with that. So I suppose it would just be a, a word of advice to all our listeners that, um, you know, along with the guidelines, keep an eye on some of the surrounding information, the FAQs and things like that, which are being updated. Um, because as we all know, that what we're, we're working within does change um, quite rapidly. So uh, I would probably dissuade it against, you know, printing them off as a hard set at a given point <laughs> in time and then, you know, using that as your go to because things move really quickly. So and I suppose today's announcement is just a classic um, example of exactly that, that things are shifting all the time. So very much living and breathing documents, I think. Yeah. Gemma, anything you want to add to that? No, I, mean, I think it's um, I think it's exciting that things are starting to move. And I think that there has been those barriers, it's particularly feeling down here in the borders with England moving forward and we're hanging back. And, the you know, I suppose it's, it's, it's misleading to people that live here, that work here and that want to come here. Um, but hopefully things will hopefully start aligning themselves over the next few weeks and we'll, you know, we will see those changes so that it is more of an even playing field and businesses in Scotland don't lose out to business in England, which I think has been the concern of late um, in terms of booking accommodation in Northumberland rather than, than the borders, for example. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Obviously, key to any of this, again, is is the safety of yourselves, the safety of mm -hmm. your customers, the safety of employees, if you have any, although Riddle was making the point earlier that an awful lot of businesses, it's just one person or just a couple running it. But important to make sure your customers, yourself, your employees are safe. And I, I guess we, we should really, in, in that, highlight the fact that there's the test and protect ser uh, advice for employers that the mm -hmm. government has on their, on their site. So again, make sure you're aware of all these things out there uh, that are available to you, that the resources that are there. Uh, Business Gateway website, bgateway.com, there's a coronavirus business support page on there, lots of information and advice on that. And we've recently reshaped that, um, basically to bring to the top the, the kind of information that businesses need to get back to business, because we've moved away from the kind of funding side of things. We've, we've been through that bit, it's still there, it's still on the site, but we've brought to the surface the, the material you need to get back to business, and that includes partner uh, advice on safe working from, for example, healthy working lives. Um, Zero Waste Scotland's Good To Go initiative, um, Doggy Bag Scheme, which enables restaurants and food businesses to sell food for takeaway. Um, we, we touched on this earlier, this was about also minimising food waste. And I suppose as, as a wee question around all of this, we, we talk and we hear these words about building back better. Mm -hmm. And the, the opportunity here to maybe think about, and, and clearly Zero Waste Scotland have this very in, much in their mind as, as being part of that response to the green economy, circular economy, climate change, and so on. What in terms of building back on the tourism sector, anyone get any kind of thoughts about what the implications might be in that kind of drive to build back better? Will, will it bring change? Will it mean things will be different? Riddle, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's quite interesting you raise that, uh, Hugh. The, you probably are aware that the, the new tourism strategy for Scotland was launched right at the beginning of March, which the timing could not have been better or worse. Um, but, I, but I think that the really interesting thing is right on the front cover of that guide, um, that, that strategy was uh, an issue about responsible tourism um, and the environment um, and climate change. So there's a big message there. Um, the the STAIR group um, have recognised that maybe all the... Uh, the issues that were taken into account in developing that uh, new strategy might have to change. And so there's been a very high level initial review of that, and Anna can probably comment more on that because she was directly involved, um, looking to see whether some of the assumptions in there should be changed and some of the uh, priorities should be different. But what's come out very strongly um, from the copies I've seen are uh, an even greater emphasis on responsible tourism and the environment and climate change, but Anna maybe can pick up in, in more detail. Yeah, yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, just as you say, Riddle, there, there was a, a real step change, I think, with this new strategy and um, it had a, a much more inclusive um, approach towards tourism. So really recognising that when we talk about sustainable tourism, it's in addition to green credentials and um, carbon emissions and, and uh, what the, the, the sector contributes in towards that, it's actually about sustainability in the widest sense. So it's how tourism as a sector for our country can really benefit all. So as we talked about, it impacts on our communities, our residents, our locals, our young people. It impacts on all of us who live and reside in Scotland. So how can tourism be absolutely a force for good to ensure that it contributes and gives back to everybody within Scotland? So it's that really wide um, sustainability um, piece and that, that that approach towards it. So I think there's a lot of content within the strategy, albeit, as you say, the timing was absolutely um, <laughs> awful. But um, so there's a lot of content within that that's still very relevant. Of course, the context of tourism in Scotland has changed dramatically since um, that strategy was developed but the, the principles of the strategy, really what's at the core of the strategy is around about how tourism can be used as a benefit for the whole of the whole of our country and for all of us who, who live within the country. So I think that sentiment remains and I think it's even more important as we start to rebuild tourism and recover um, in the months and, and time to come what role do our, our wider communities play in that? What, what sort of tourism do we want for our, of our local destinations? What sort of tourism are we we're looking to build and attract for our country? So I think, yeah, yeah it is that broader look and I think um, how we define sustainable and responsible tourism, you know, I think it, it is in that broader sense um, and how it impacts on all of us. So there's a lot to take from that strategy. So um, thankfully it's not it's not going to be completely chucked in the bin. There's, there's a lot of good content in there that we'd be working with and driving forward, albeit within a different set of circumstances. It's not business as usual would be silly to think it was um, and I think we also need to fully recognise that our visitors are going to have uh, different expectations and um, different norms now in terms of how they travel and experience tourism and experience attractions so we need to be um, recognising that our customers expectations have changed as well and we need to adapt to that. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think as well I've seen, I've seen an article this morning it's about trying to encourage the people that live in Scotland to really uh, to, to really appreciate what they've got on their doorstep. You know, let's make sure that they want to come on holiday here. Let's inspire them to stay local, explore Scotland rather than jumping on a plane somewhere else. There was, it was an article about saying, oh, it'll do, you know, that they'll just stay here. But it, it shouldn't be about that. We need to try and get them to all be ambassadors for Scotland and really get them to explore every corner of it as well. And then I think, I think that, that, that will help with the whole responsible tourism thing as well. Yeah, that's good. You, you touched earlier, Gemma, on on the, the the kind of need, perhaps, for businesses, and and they have responded to this about getting online and 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 you know being much more digitally savvy about what what they're doing. And and I think, and we certainly explored this in in the, the previous webinar that in the wider economy, as as a response to this situation, with so many people now, perhaps saying, well. I can work from home, as folk can see behind me. I'm sitting in the dining room. I'm working from home. It's possible to do that. So um, maybe more of that needs to be happening. So digital um, opportunities are there. And obviously, through Business Gateway, we have the Digital Boost Programme, which is about helping businesses to become more digitally savvy, more digitally capable. And I, I accept that digital connectivity is not great across the whole of Scotland, there are places where it's it's not as good. But in the past, certainly, I've, I've heard that perhaps there are not that many tourism businesses in Scotland, or a, a number of tourism businesses in Scotland, that are not online, that are not digitally enabled or, or, or doing that. Do we need more of that, Gemma? Do you think do you need we need more of those tourism businesses to become digitally aware, digitally connected? One hundred percent. I mean, I, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but when I started MB Tag, I think it was about sixty percent of businesses down this area didn't were not were not online. Um, so that was one of our key um, goals was to try and take a, a huge cohort through the training with Digital Tourism Scotland. Obviously, leading them in with Business Gate with Digital Boost. We've got the toolkit which I've just we've just launched yesterday to try and look at other techie solutions. But going back to the basics, just even being online. Nobody's going to pick up the phone anymore to say, "Can I have a table for two tonight, please?" It's you know everybody does have it in their hand and their phone all the time, so and it can be done quite cheaply and, and and effectively whether you work with an OTA or whether you have um you know just making sure that you have got that online presence. You don't need to build a 
website that's going to cost you thousands of pounds. You can do things, but you need to make sure people can find you too. So search engine optimization, etc., is always really important. Um, or if you're with a DMO, or simple things like being with visit on visitscotland.com, you know, the, there are opportunities to be online, and it's about you. You will be found, but if you're not online, come next year, I think that even less will be found. So that okay. is, that's one big thing that we're pushing as well down this way. Is, come on, we need to make sure that we take. We do, we're going to do an audit to try and help businesses go and get on that journey. Even the simple, a simple start, and education on how it works, social media. Um, yeah. the, the issue is is resource, as we know, most of the businesses across Scotland are SMEs or one man bands. So yeah. how do they do marketing and how do they get breakfast and someone's a table and how do they make beds and mm -hmm. how do they do everything? So that's why a DMO is really important so they can help with the marketing aspects um, in conjunction with the businesses. Okay, Rudolph, do you want to add to that? Yeah, just um, I mean, I the, the thing is that that whole issue has changed dramatically um, in the past three or four years, but. Uh, Jim is right. There are still a not insignificant number of uh, businesses that are listed on visitscotland.com that you cannot book uh, online. Mm -hmm. Now, we've worked out some pretty scary figures about the amount of lost business uh, that that represents. And, you know, as I go around the country and present, you always get somebody saying, ah, but you didn't understand. I like to speak to the visitor. And my response to that is, I've got news for you. They didn't want to speak to you, you know. And I, I think, joking aside, that it, it is that is crucial. And I, I believe, as Jim has just said, if people are not online visible and not not online bookable, then they will not survive. Um, and this uh, whole crisis has brought that into even greater focus. So I think that whole issue about using the resources that are currently available, and you know. The reason why your arch enemy down the road that runs the same B and B as you uh, is busy and you're not is quite simply because they are online book of all. They've got a brilliant website. They use great photography. They use social media, and they are doing all the things that you would expect. And they're part of an association or a local group. And all of these things, I I, I had a, a slide that I used to use. Uh, I put up when I used to work for the Borders Tourist Board nearly 30 years ago. And the same issues there apply today as they did 30 years ago. The good businesses are doing all of these things. Um, and it isn't it rocket science and it does not need to cost a lot of money. So it's a really important message. Um, yeah. And again, learn from those that are doing it really well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's some really nice examples, actually. I think it's one that's on, on your website, Riddle, uh, visitscotland.org. There's a really nice example of Space Out Wildlife, which is a, a company um, based in our, our region. And uh, during lockdown, when, of course, people haven't been able to travel, um, they've kept really nice social engagement with their customers. So they've been doing, um, it's a, a, they call it Daily Bird Song. And it's lovely. It's just really simple. It's just about getting out with your with your phone and actually filming what wildlife they're seeing on their doorstep that morning and sharing that. And the engagement you get from that is is incredible. So I think it's been super important and really important during this period of lockdown. And as we emerge from it, I think the role that digital plays is going to be still as important, if not more. I mean, there's opportunities if, if you want to give your customers reassurance that you're taking steps within your business to make sure it's safe and clean and that you've addressed all these guidelines. You know, do a little film, walk through your business, walk through your property, you know, show the customers exactly what they can expect when they arrive, how they're going to um, park, how they're going to get their luggage out of their car, all these things. You know, you can do all of those things really quite cheaply and get it on your Facebook or, or get it up there because customers are going to be seeking that reassurance. They're going to want to know that they're going to be safe when they come and engage with whatever it is that you're providing them. So, again, I think digital is a, a huge tool for making that information available. Excellent. Again, okay. in the toolkit that is available is all about online ticketing, etc. So it's not just about accommodation, but if you're a visitor attraction, we've got to avoid this whole queuing system. We've got to make sure that tickets are bought in advance. So there are solutions within that toolkit uh, which will be shared after as well. So it's, it's, that's that whole process of thinking about making it as easy as possible for the customer. But then in advance, you'll also you, you'll know who's coming in advance as well, which is also going to help you as a business. No, oh, that's good. So digital folks, you've heard it really important and there are things like the digital boost program there that can give you free support to, to workshops and webinars to help you with that so we've talked a lot about people restarting businesses uh, in the, the few minutes we have left there's a, a question from daniel jack um, and, and daniel has the interesting situation that daniel isn't restarting a business He's starting a business, which is actually really interesting because if we look at the stuff that's getting downloaded from the Business Gateway website, 
Yes, a lot of it's coronavirus support, but actually lots of folk are picking up information on starting a business. So he's starting up an alternative and eco-tourist accommodation business in North Ayrshire. Any advice for this tourism business starting at the most interesting of times? Riddle. Yeah, loads of advice. Um, so um, I'll get uh, Daniel's details and we'll put him in touch with our industry relationship manager for the area, number one. He needs to join whatever local association that exists in his area. Um, and he also needs to get his free entry on visitscotland.com. <laughs> those, those, are, those are three things right away. And in terms of accommodation... And get digitally connected. Get digitally, yes. digitally connected. But also, uh, if it's if it's um, self-catering accommodation, then, I mean, I'm, and I'm not on commission here, but needs to be a member of the Association of Scotland Self-Caterers because they're doing an incredible okay. job in terms of communication. So it's that point that we've all made already that being on your own, you don't need to be. There are loads of opportunities to work with others, learn from others and benefit from trust referrals. And there are systems in place all the way through. So I'll get Daniel's details and I'll, I'll make sure that he gets the right person from our organisation to be in touch with him. OK, I'm going to jump quickly on to the next thing because I'm very conscious of time. We, we had a question from Peter Braidwood, and what he was asking, are there any thoughts or plans to resurrect the Year of the Coast theme in the future? I'm going yeah. to throw that out. Somebody, pick that one up. Yeah, I yeah, know. Um, again, the, the timing could not have been worse um, in terms of the virus. Um, we've managed to get approval from Scottish Government to carry forward the Year of Coast and Waters into next year. The final detail of that is still to be ironed out, but um, the the main events programme will happen next year rather than this year because obviously a lot of it's had to be cancelled. Um, so to, to reassure uh, Peter that will uh, be resurrected next year. The only issue we're, we're struggling with at the moment is um, the impact that that has on the following year, which was the year of storytelling. So it's whether or not that slips a year as well. So. Again, suggest you check visitscotland.org. But the good news is that Year of Coast and Waters will continue into next year, definitely. Excellent. Okie dokie. And uh, another wee question here. Uh, we've, we've kind of touched on this, and it was from Ewan McLachlan in Discover Ascent, and it was about management of demand. Gemma, you were kind of touching that earlier about getting the online bookings, about getting you know visitor attractions ticketing in advance. So I guess the message really there, you and as we've kind of touched on, is, and, and we touched on earlier about the information that's available from the DMOs, the information that's unavailable on visitscotland.com. We need to encourage the visitors to check in advance about what the situation is. Any kind of last thoughts, Anna? Anything else you want to add to to that? I think that I think you've you've hit the nail on the head, Hugh. It is really about that. It's be aware, plan ahead, don't turn up unexpectedly without having done your homework before you set off out on your be it a day trip or a an overnight, whatever it is that you're you're looking to do and experience. There's there's lots of resources out there. Um most of the destinations and as Visit Scotland, as Riddles mentioned, um the local authorities were making that information available. So um I think it's just about all of us taking that responsibility to to plan ahead and to be aware and to ensure that we're we're not gonna come up against a surprise when we arrive somewhere with um, our expectations unmet. So, and businesses to to make make your information available as well, so that customers can find it. So, if you're changing your opening hours, you know, make that available on your Facebook. Try and get it onto your 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 Google and um, your business profile as well around about your different. You know, there's just all of that information needs to be available as much as we can get it to to customers okay. and to the businesses themselves. I think as well, just one quick point. Yeah, sorry. One quick point on that would be is if you if you do end up fully booked because obviously your your numbers are limited now because of COVID and queues and uh, systems, is making sure that you then offer an alternative to one of your local other businesses. So if you're at a visitor attraction, okay, we can't take any more, but why don't you go to such and such a place down the road and try and keep you know moving that moving that business around. But like you know, like we were saying before, it's making sure that you know what product is open in the area because there will be some that might decide not to open until next year. Um, I mean, what we don't want is visitors coming to somewhere and not being able to get into a location or a business or something either. So um, about, it's, about, it's about collaboration again, making sure that you know other businesses in the area and speaking to your DMO. No worries. Riddle, final 10 second thought. <laughs> I just totally agree with the uh, uh, panel members. Uh, absolutely. Um, you've nailed it all in the head. 
Mm -hmm. Superb. Okay, we are nearly out of time. Thank you to Anna, to Gemma, to Riddle for some really excellent and practical advice and thoughts this afternoon. Key message, folks, there's lots of help out there. There's lots of guidance out there. We'll make sure the links are, are sent with the, the presentation. Um, key message really is stay safe, look after yourselves, do what you can. We, we are all thinking of you and, and the work that you're doing, and we're there to support you. All the best, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Take care.